Dan. I've known Aaron. I've known so many of, of you for a long time now. And I realized that we have, we've never actually met. I've never yeah. been, even though I've spent a little bit of time in Tucson, I was at the Poetry Center in residence back in the year 2000. I really, this is a new place for me. It's just such a privilege to be a part of this community. And in terms of where I come from and what I do, I studied philosophy and I found it to be exhilarating and deeply frustrating. Mm -hmm. Exhilarating because I was working with ideas every day and I was working with people who were extraordinarily intelligent, much smarter than I was, much more adept at logic and argumentation, but also with specializations that precluded any real conversation outside of that particular space that I was that I was operating in, this academic context. And I I got into philosophy like everything in life out of this naive idea that I had. I've always been essentially a child as far as how I look at the world, how I think about the world. And I had this idea that philosophy was asking big questions and having great conversations with everybody. And that just is not how it works in a university setting. And this is true across the board, of course, in terms of specialization in different departments. But philosophy is maybe even more extreme. I don't think that my mother could understand a word of what I was saying. In fact, she told me as much. And <laughs> that, that to me is a really good, uh, a good way to, to judge whether what I'm talking about makes any sense. Yeah. So I kind of took a step back and said, how can I do what I've always wanted to do? How can I be a philosopher where I'm not the one telling people anything? I'm in conversation with people and we're learning together. And there was one, I, I, I fled academia, I smuggled out what I could. And there was one <laughs> thing in particular that really has stuck with me. And that is what's known as a thought experiment. And thought experiment is very briefly where you posit an alternate reality. And it's a form of argumentation. It's a rhetorical device that's used that you kind of you lead somebody down a path until they reach a, a, a statement that is manifestly absurd. And therefore, you trap them and they have to concede to whatever it is that you had meant for them to believe. And I never really was able to believe in any of that because I don't have anything to say. I have a lot of questions to ask. So what I wanted to do from the outset was to find a, find methods for new new conversations. So I took the thought experiment literally. I said, well, this idea of positing an alternative reality, a, a different world that is much like ours, but just a little bit different. This could be a really powerful way in which to go about asking big questions. And also I thought about philosophical instruments, these sort of devices that have been used historically in philosophy as a way in which to literally to grapple with ideas. And so I started to take these methods out into the world. And just to give one really brief example, I've been developing cameras and I started out up the road with the competition, ASU that is, uh, on a project with a camera that has a thousand year long exposure time. And it takes a single exposure over that thousand year period of Tempe, which is admittedly no Tucson, but nevertheless, it's a really interesting place in terms of a city that almost is accidental and tells us a lot about our future in terms of what happens there. So the idea is that the camera is taking a, an exposure over a thousand years and that people in a thousand years potentially will be able to see what happened, what choices we made, what we did. And so it gives us a way potentially to, to look at ourselves from the far future and potentially to change the picture. So I see it as being a sort of a philosophical instrument, but not in the rarefied world of a lot of that was in the realm of the gentleman philosopher. And that was an elite that really was not engaged with anybody else. And also, this is something that I think academia really hasn't figured out how to do that I'm trying to do, and I've become really interested in doing it 
in collaboration within academia because there's such deep knowledge and because there's a potential to take that knowledge. And I don't see what I do as outreach or translation. I see it as to some extent provocation, though not in the sense of being obnoxious, I hope, or aggressive more. A troublemaker, maybe a trickster, uh, somebody who's kind of taking what's there and just maybe getting it a little mixed up in my own head and saying, well, what if? And that what if is the essence, I think, of the thought experiment and is the essence of philosophy. And that's really, that's the only thing that I do all day long is I just ask the question as basic as that. I love that. And I think one of the questions you started asking us early on in what it's been the focus of, will you tell me how long it's been the focus of your work, but time, right? The, yeah. the thousand year exposure clock is a great example. And, you know, as we've talked a lot about the, you know, and I often say like kind of what is the, you know, distinguishing factor or element of the desert laboratory and it's our long-term approach to understanding relationships and, and that longer approach to time. So there, I think there's a real natural, um, kind of linkage there, although you take our 100-year data set and, and raise it an order or two of magnitude. <laughs> but maybe talk a little bit about, yeah, where, how you engage time in your work. There's such awesome uh, examples of that project, fluvial time, uh, the, you know, the bristle cone clock, and then as applying in the, we're talking about desert time, that we've talked a lot about. So, um, yeah. Well, I, I think that, first of all, just to say that what has been happening Atu Amak for a long time has been an inspiration to me for a long time, in particular, the test plots and especially the repeat photography. I obviously, by virtue of what I just described with these very long term exposures, I have a real interest in what photography can tell us about the world, what it can reveal. But I'm also I'm really interested in natural systems and all of the natural systems that I'm finding in a place like this, that I'm able in some cases to take ideas that I've developed in other ecosystems and to start to look at what would happen if we were to explore those ideas here. And so one of these is, as you mentioned, I've been kind of obsessed with time for as long as I can remember. I'm, I'm always running late as I was today. So I guess that maybe it's just a personal anxiety, but it also comes out of this conviction that I think that when time became technical, something really profound happened in society. A lot of things happened, but not all of them good. And what I mean by when time became technical is that we've always worked in numerous ways in terms of how we've kept track of when when to do one thing or another. But at a certain point, we started looking at the clock. And that became particularly the case through industrialization, the Industrial Revolution, through the railroads, where you really didn't want two trains to be keeping time based on two different systems. You can imagine what happens. So what happened as a result of this, beyond the fact that the railroads arguably ran on time, is that we became detached, I think, from a lot of the natural systems that were the basis for these mechanical systems. These mechanical systems became abstractions that allowed us to coordinate society in ways that we were able to act without noticing the consequences of our actions. And without noticing the impact of our actions on the planet. Yes, yeah. So what I've been trying to do is to figure out not how do we go back, not how do we deny who and what we are today, but how might we integrate what, what came before and what has always been the case and what remains the case in many cultures around the world. That is to say, the sense of time as a an emergent phenomenon of the planet itself as can be observed through different life forms and living systems. So I started out with trees. I started out with looking at redwood trees and then a bristle cone 
pine trees that have an exposure, sorry, not an exposure time. They have a lifespan of 2,000 years in the first case, and in the second case, up to 5,000 years. So thinking about something that you do here that has interested me for a long time, which is by way of the tree ring lab, didrochronology, the way in which not only does a tree grow a ring every year, but the thickness varies from year to year based on all sorts of climate conditions. So this becomes a way in which to do archaeological research on when the wood in a house was harvested. It also becomes a way in which to look back in time in terms of climate and climate change. So what I wanted to do is to look forward in time. So I thought of what if I were to not to chop down a tree, but were to take a sapling and to put markers around it, radiating out, anticipating based on the current average annual growth of that tree, 100 years, 500 years, in the case of a risk of pine tree, all the way out to 5,000 years in the future, placing in space those markers such that the tree then can let us know what time it is based on its growth, mm -hmm. where that will tell us a time that might not be what the Gregorian calendar, what your smartwatch tells you. And so then my proposition has been, what if we were to give the tree authority to let us know what time it is? So I've, I've done this with trees. I've also worked in Alaska recently, and I'm starting to work in Vienna and other cities with rivers with, with fluvial time. The idea of if you were to put a water wheel into a river that was rotating at one RPM on average now, and you were then to allow that to become the basis for telling time in the future, well, it might get ahead of or behind based on in the case of Alaska, based on glacial melt, but it also would be stochastic. In other words, it'd be unpredictable. And it would make it so that it would give us a sort of prompt that we need to be paying attention constantly. We need to be paying attention to the world in terms of the long-term impact of our actions, but also we need to be in the moment. And it's that connection at two different levels that I'm really interested in. And Part of what really fascinates me about coming to Tumaluk and spending a little bit of time now watching people interacting here, mm -hmm. walking the hill in a ritualistic way, and that can ritual can mean anything, but in the way that people seem to kind of keep time in their lives based on their mm -hmm. walking the hill, but also that it changes from season to season. It changes as your, your health changes. It changes based on who you're with. And I think that all of those indicators really strike me as being very much in the space that interests me. And so I've then been thinking and talking with you about in the new resilience garden, how might we how might we we achieve what I think of as chronodiversity, as kind of an analog to biodiversity. How can we make more present the lived experience of time of all these other organisms and, and living systems as a way in which to have a broader view of ourselves within the world and to be able to relate to each other and to other living beings in a more open way that we can all we can all live together and we can all at some level we can all work together in terms of not working at cross purposes with each other so at last check that had manifested itself in correct me if i'm wrong but two more or less kind of different ways to get at the chronodiversity especially related to plants right so one is regarding kind of with the annual plants and, and we all connected to Larry's research on the annual flora when he shared that. And then the other is more focused on the perennial plants. Do you want to describe a little more, more in detail each of those? And Sure. Yeah. So we're, we're really, I think, starting with the perennials with, with trees, looking at the skeet, at desert, ironwood, and at the blue palo verde, three different trees that are long lived with different lifespans and also with, the, they, they, they have different ways in which they've evolved, therefore different ways in which they're sensing their environment and processing what they sense. And they have different needs uh, as a matter of their biology, as a matter of their, how they've evolved. So the idea is to take th those three and for each of them to do have that those markers that are radiating out from them and to have each of them indicating time in the resilience garden, all of them having authority, mm -hmm. but each of them in terms of their divergence also telling a story about 
how we need to not only think about it's not us versus them. It's not a matter of us getting off of human time toward um, the vaunted time of the desert iron where the desert iron wood knows all and that we know nothing. That's as bad as our assumptions previously that we know everything and they know nothing. It's a matter of building a conversation. And the conversation is a conversation that's happening in terms of these different sensations of time. So the annuals bring a whole separate level into this. Mm -hmm. And in that case, it's much more a matter of in the moment, what we're experiencing. And in that case, it's a matter of saying an annual, it lives through the year. It is a sort of a calendar, an annual calendar in a sense, but the months are not months as we think of them. They're phenomena such as germination and fluorescence. And so the idea is to live or to at least offer that as an alternative time standard again, creating a, a way in which people are able to observe more acutely or at least prompting people to engage more directly with those plants by marking the days for each of four, probably it will be four phases based on the conversations with Larry, it makes the most sense uh to to look at germination fluorescence um seeding and then dormancy okay. and so each one of those then counting the days hmm. and having a calendar a peg calendar as a way in which to track that where you are advancing a peg every day and you're able to read the time according to that that annual and ideally we're doing that on the hill and also in other places around tucson and this is helping Larry do his research and other researchers in desert annuals do their research because it's prompting people to be making these observations beyond the hill. And this is something that he really hasn't been able to do for what he was telling me. So there's that aspect of it, but there's also the aspect of it, of this being a, a way in which, you know, it's a prosthesis in a sense, it's, it's a, uh, it's a it's a simplified way in which you see something that's extremely complex, but it's a, it's a way into that complexity. And once we get into that complexity, I think there are all sorts of other dimensions of time that will come out of this for each of us individually and for us collectively as we start to we start to engage each other about what what's happening in the world. And ultimately, all of these, I see the, the calendar and the clock as having the potential to be observatories where we're observing in time and through time all the other phenomena on our planet that are filtered through that, that are manifested within time. And what you do, what scientists do that I tremendously admire that I could never do myself very well is this incredible level of observation, mm -hmm. the specificity with which the observation that the protocol is developed and then the level of analysis that allows for making really powerful predictions amongst other things, obviously understanding the system as well. I'm interested in something that I think is complementary to that. I hope that it is, which is what if we take it all in aggregate? What if we think about it not in terms of the analysis and reducing down to a term that can be analyzed, but we take the aggregate of all of the phenomena, all of which that desert ironwood tree is experiencing, and that output that we can observe, that is the rate at which it's living, it's life. Can that be a way in which we can enter into a sort of a total system, a total living system, where we're not for a moment trying to tease out what, what is causal or even what even is a correlation, but rather trying to have a sort of an intuition and the, an intuition that leads maybe to heuristics that can guide us as humans more effectively, but also I think just bringing us into that system. Can we just to some small extent without diluting ourselves, live our lives from the perspective of these other species, just enough that we are not not so much that we're anthropomorphizing them, but just enough that we're able also to admit that into our worldview. So thinking about the aggregate <clears throat> nature and thinking about the observations and the science, 
the interrelation there making me think you have to be very careful on the inputs that mm -hmm. you select to take that read. So I'm thinking about the uh, um, the calendar. Yeah. How, so for the annual plants, like what does that look like? For example, I think one of the species you were thinking talking about or focusing on is the Pectocaria recurvata, I think it's the- The Kerbeckum seed. Exactly. I mean, best name ever. How could you <laughs> possibly resist a plant like that? And so when you think about maybe just map it a little bit for you know the visual of the stewards because one of the key things with the with the, the, the all of you who are walking hill and working with the steward is you're going to be helping us keep track of this calendar right and working with the peg kids so you know let's say for example it doesn't rain this winter which right. is a very real possibility being at la nina is that going to be you know dormancy day 89 or 110 or what, yeah, walk us through like what are the inputs into the calendar? What does it look like? And how are, are we, each one of us, you conceptually, us actually doing the work, bridging the, the two ways of keeping track of time? So we're still working this out, but the idea would be a, a stone monument. And I'm using the monument in not in the sense of being grandiose or even large, but something that that will stand the test of time mm -hmm. uh, in a very an environment that is quite harsh in uh, in terms of its effect on a lot of material. So basically, you might imagine a circle with 366 holes in it, and that circle takes a peg, and the peg is advanced every day in a, a in a month according to that desert annual. And then there is also a part of this where that month is indicated. So if it never, if the Kerbax cone seed never germinates, mm -hmm. you're going to be in the month of dormancy for 366 days. Mm -hmm. If it germinates and then it dies, then you're going to remain in germination. These are never going to get past germination. And when you get to the end of the year, then you're starting the cycle over again. So it's, it's a way in which to, I'm hoping, through you, the stewards, and then through everybody who encounters these, because these flowers, of course, anybody who gets Arizona Highways magazine knows what it's like when you have that great fluorescence. But there are a lot of details that go unnoticed, from my understanding, even amongst people who, who live here, who are not directly involved in studying these these plants. So the idea is partly just to use that, make that a prompt to look more closely to the plant, but also to make it official and to make it official in as something that you can commit to in your life. So in the case of the calendars, I've been working with Earth Law Center on legislation that would actually mandate that that arboreal time would be a legal time standard in Tucson. Mm -hmm. for instance. And I'm working on fluvial time in in Atlanta, where I'm working on the Chattahoochee River, as another example. So having these as legal time standards, and I think that likewise, we could think about this for these annuals. So what would it be like to live your life on that time, where you and I plan that we're going to meet on the 10th of fluorescence? And right now, we're in the month of germination. Mm -hmm. We don't know when that's going to be. But at some level, the way in which we live our lives and all of us do is going to have an effect on that. And that is also, that's, that's the reality of the planet on which we live and not, well, on one level, it's a matter of how do we overcome or undermine the hubris that has gotten us into the situation of, of believing ourselves to be in control of the planet and acting without observing the consequences of our actions. But another part of it is and it's related, of course, is the sort of humility, the sort of sense that we we're all in it together, including me, you, and the Kerbak Cone seed. And we all need to figure out how do we how do we come to terms with the fact that we're all we're all on my time and on your time and on the Kerbak Cone seeds time. And by having this system in place that is one that draws you to the hill so that 
Ideally, people are going to make the observation themselves, and they're doing so regularly, but also by having it some, as something that is available potentially online where you haven't come to the Hill, you can still have mm -hmm. some sort of sense of connection to the Hill, and it can still be a way in which to, to go about your life. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think your fluvial time is a great example of how you're creating that timestamp for people and the dynamic nature of it remotely. Um, we'll put in the link in a, in a little bit, hopefully the, the link to this great webpage that is connected to the Fluvial Time Project. So regarding those two calendars, you know, the, you have the, the, well, the chronodiversity within the annuals and then the perennials is kind of the extreme, perhaps of the plants uh, timekeeping from the, annual approach to these, you know, some of the oldest lived individuals here is, do you see a space for somewhere in the middle or how, you know, how are we going to, how can we as the stewards and the liaisons for people help uh, people walk in the hill navigate and interact with those two uh, extremes? Well, I think that I hope that these will communicate effectively but I also know that more communication based on those who know these systems, enticing others to, to observe and bringing others, effectively making us all what I think of as community timekeepers and where Tumamak is that community. So I think that a really important part of it is going to be to, for us, all to go onto that time standard, those time standards as well, and to be able to speak to those experiences and to ideally increase the number of people, each of whom this will have different meaning. Mm -hmm. And many of whom, and I really wanna be very respectful here because there are so many people who are already so incredibly attuned to all of these life forms and there are many people who are already living mm -hmm. on other calendars. It isn't that I'm speaking about myself when I say that this this Western calendar, this this system that is based on um, mechanization of time, that's me. And that may not be you. And there are a lot of people who walk the hill for whom that's not the case. And part of what I hope will happen is that people will feel more comfortable sharing those experiences and those perspectives with others who maybe this is just a, this is a way into these these other ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, I also think in terms of that middle space that you know I I don't know what I'm doing. I am an amateur. I am a dilettante, and I I am trying to get involved in whatever I can out of curiosity and, and out of interest in seeing where it might go. But really, it's going to be all of you who are going to come up with far more engaging ways in which to engage some of the systems that I'm setting up, but also systems that you're going to come up with that are going to be much more interesting. I'm fascinated by the ways in which we can think about the Suaro and the oscillations that yeah. are manifest in terms of the accordion yeah. folding <clears throat> of the Suaros. How, how does that manifest? What do, what do we make of that? I'm also at another extreme. I'm, none of you can see it, but there's a pack rat midden right over there. <laughs> and the pack rat midden is another. another one of these. This, this hill is yeah. literally 40,000 yes. years of compressed time. Right here. This is this is a, a hill that is living in time in so many different ways. Fossil fossilized uh, giant ground sloth poop, you know, another example. N nicely <laughs> bagged up at a zip <laughs> for for uh, convenience, cash and carry. <laughs> so so yeah, I and one thing that I really hope is I want to spend more time here. I would like to be engaging with with all of you and figuring figuring this out, thinking this through. This, this proposition of chronodiversity is relatively new to me. It's really just a, 
a word that I come up with as a way in which to remind myself of what I'm trying to discover in a broader sense, how, how biodiversity manifests in terms of time, how that can be a way in which to be more open and inviting in my own life and also as a society, how we can be more open and inviting to other life forms. But this is really nascent and every, every day I learn and every day, therefore, if you talk to me about this tomorrow, I'm going to say something completely different as not because I'm trying to lie to you right now or because I'm, um, I'm just totally deluded tomorrow. I'm half deluded today and half deluded tomorrow, but it's a delusion that is constantly evolving in the experience. I wouldn't necessarily, you'd say something completely different, but you're certainly going to have another idea. Yes. I will have, <laughs> definitely have, have three other ideas. And, and the thing is that I'll inflict them all upon you. And <laughs> um, I mean, so just maybe to, to have you talk a little bit sure. about, you know, I, I've, I'm an interloper. I've come in here with a bunch of different ideas and mm. I'm curious, what do you see as the Hill and more broadly, the space that this occupies within the university and within the, the greater Tucson community? What, what sort of role do you mm. see for for philosophy, for art, or for whatever it is that right. we're trying to do together here? You know, I think it fits really firmly in our unique opportunity to experiment with getting people to take a step out away from the familiar as they're walking on the familiar. So really thinking about the Tumamak Hill Road as the, a conduit through time, um, so we've talked so much in these various conversations and the, the basic fra fra framework we operate here with the Desert Laboratory is there's so many layers uh, represented in space and time here, all coexisting. I mean, just the objects that you're talking about sitting around us yeah. in this office, the spirits that, you know, uh, you know I'm, I'm never lonely working late mm -hmm. here. There's, there's, there's so much that is present here in this space. So thinking, and because of the nature we have of the visitation dynamics here from, I would say on average, and this is a data point we don't have, but on average through a year, an individual probably visits the space, I would say 20, years, 20 times over that year. That's a random guess, mm -hmm. but that's a high number of repeat visits. Yeah. And so you're getting, an incredible opportunity of continued observation in a particular space that you don't really get other way. And it can just be latent um, where you're, someone's not necessarily overtly looking at that same saguaro or that same little track, but there they are. And that's one of the, so there's so many opportunities and that that's one of the really cool things about the resilience garden and how we're going to be taking everybody through that space, uh, regardless if you're wanting to linger or you're just wanting to make your good time, that you're going to see that space change. So mm -hmm. that's really cool. And then in terms of the opportunities for the uh, thought experiments that you're talking about, we can try them and, and, and put them in place here in ways that are not um, heavy handed and they're little entry points for inviting people to think differently about a space they've been interacting with for years, decades, or maybe they've just come to it or they've just come to the desert. I, I think I may, I don't know if I shared this last time, but, and I'd be curious for the stewards, but we've recently, when I've been interacting with people walking the hill, just having conversations, the majority of the people I've talked to actually, it's, they've just recently come here. So there's one of the things that we also have an incredible opportunity here in engaging what you're talking about is there's so much, there's a lot of influx of, uh, you know, it's people saying uh, when you rarely meet someone from Tucson, mm. that we're a rare breed. That's an interesting point, but it's a true one. People, there's so much uh, transient nature and so many people that are not from the desert. And I think one of the things that's really interesting about this current influx that we're having, because the properties are relatively less expensive in our part of the world relative to people coming from more, um, you know, 
places of higher cost of living, what that entry point of the when the clock starts for someone who's just moving to Tucson in terms of the, how they interact with what the landscape looks right like right now in an era of constant change, be it invasive species, be it mortality from drought, be it decreasing water from water, from you know, just water shortages. You know, what is what is the entry point for people to think about how do they understand this landscape they're moving into? And I think spaces like Tumamak Hill, because they're probably gonna chances are word of mouth is going to say, have you checked that out? Have you liked that hell yet? We have a unique opportunity to interact with them. So for all of those reasons, everything you're talking about um, is perfectly in line with the, with the opportunity, where, what the stories we want to be telling. I, lo I love how the Desert Laboratory is a laboratory in so many different senses of the word and doesn't try to narrow that down into being too right. much any one of those and so i call myself an experimental philosopher as a job title because i i don't know what i do but i don't and i don't want to know what i do in the sense of being defined in any way but i do feel like i'm trying to undertake these thought experiments i'm trying to i'm trying to figure out who and what we are how how the world works and a large part of that, an increasing part of that, is in the realm of ecology and community, mm -hmm. which are two pillars here. Absolutely. And so the idea of Tumamak Hill as a laboratory in which to, to, to do, potentially to pioneer a, a, new, a new way of doing philosophy, this experimental philosophy, where the laboratory is an open laboratory, where the discovery process is one that we're all undertaking together. It's really exciting to me. Well, let's talk a little bit about the Future Climate Proverbs project sure. that we kicked off on Saturday, because I think it's an awesome example of exactly that. So that was the workshop that we had Saturday in the Boathouse, um, <clears throat> which it really invited participants to work together and think through their own observations, their own interaction, and, and relationship with climatic, uh, I would say both dynamics and also traditions, right? Mm. Things that are so re repetitive that they've been codified into sayings, but also they represent the changing of the seasons and trying to forecast that and make space for or come up with new proverbs that reflect the, the era of change that, and uncertainty that we're in. So maybe talk a little bit about, and also what I'm relating to is when you were talking about so much of this work is driven by what people create and their responses. That was in large evidence at the workshop in terms of the logbooks people created. So talk a little bit about you know the your thoughts with the future climate proverbs, and then let's talk a little bit about you know the uh, installation element that's going to be on the hill. So this is been really interesting starting a new project here with with all of you and this is really the way in which i i like to work most which is starting out with a conversation and then saying let's see what happens mm -hmm. and then and let, let's build on that and so it it started out really with this i had found a book in a used bookstore that was on weather lore and it was published by the Department of Agriculture around 1903 or something like that and I got really interested I don't know why I bought it but it just it struck me it was a beautiful blue cover so maybe it was just it was kind of really nice on my shelf but I, I just got more and more curious about there were all these weather proverbs in the book and I just got curious about I wonder how many of these are still valid today in the sense that where people use these proverbs, so April showers bring May flowers, red sky at night, shepherds delight, often though very much from a given place that then these places have changed, climate has changed. So just wondering whether that change in the climate, whether these still held true, got me thinking about weather proverbs in relation to climate, that this could be a way in which to do 
paleoclimatological research that we could actually we could learn something about past climates in terms of what was preserved in language, but also recognizing that that preservation in language is a really powerful aspect of it. It gives us now something that we may need even more, or at least as much as people needed these in the past. In the past, there was a deep need for them because you couldn't just go onto Google to find out what the weather was going to be tomorrow. And, you know, not like the weather channel is exactly always right anyway. It, it, nevertheless, the weather proverbs were a means of survival. They, they gave you a, a way in which to predict what was going to happen, work, work well enough that these were preserved and that they were retold, they, they, they've survived. That was really important. But I think that now a large part of what we're experiencing are what are sometimes called shifting baselines, this, this way in which with the changing climate, a change in the environment is taken as the baseline for the next change in the environment. The second is a baseline for the next change. And as a result, you kind of have this slippage and the slippage can allow for a complacency in terms of right. you know, recognizing the impact of our actions. So these proverbs are, they're mnemonics, they're tools, they're means by which to remember. So it got me thinking about how we could recollect shared past by sharing these proverbs, how we could share our different heritages as a way in which to be able to build a community that we desperately need today to be able to contend with all the hardships of climate change on human society as well as for other creatures, but also that we could take this as a creative process going forward and we could create our own proverbs today that might be mnemonics, that might be ways in which we could remember and we could use this to, we'd use this aspirationally, a way to remember what it is that we aspire to. We could use this also as a way to remember what is right now in order then to be able to check ourselves against what we allow to happen. Mm -hmm. So a couple, examples that of the new proverbs that were promoted that were suggested or put forth during the workshop as the climate gets drier watch out for fire um flowers on the arms of saguaros means a hotter uncertain tomorrow um as temperatures rises so does your shoreline um weeping as sadly as the last glacier uh when your pea turns brown it's fine to lay down uh, when the rain lily blooms, clear your gutter for monsoons. And when your neck hair stands, put your belly in the sand. Um, rain comes down and mosquitoes abound. There's some great examples. Another one that was really impactful um, to share was the, it's kind of more of a poem, honestly. The, the, this was um, Ganesh, a graduate student. Somewhere inside a cave in the mountains amid the desert, Sleeping survival, a black bear hides. A dream to come and awake to fear. Warmer winters, shallower streams, snowstorms, halter, no more black bear dreams. Really powerful. That's really beautiful. <clears throat> and, and so many of these, but some of them are very funny and that's really effective. Right. You remember that. Some of them are really beautiful and you want to tell them to somebody else and that's really powerful. So all of these, just in terms of how we, how we remember and how we communicate, those are two functions I think that the Proverbs have had in the past that I would like. And it isn't just Proverbs. As I said in the workshop, also stories yeah. have this power and so how can we tap into our abilities as storytellers to tell these stories that can serve many different functions? And I think that from what you've read, it shows 
Now, I started out the workshop by saying, I remember back in the year 2000, I spent the summer here in an adobe that was lent to me by the Poetry Center. And I remember every single day I knew when the rain was coming mm. because the cicadas would start singing and they would hit a certain pitch. And it was right after that that I knew the rains were coming. And how, well, that was really useful because I wouldn't get stuck on my bicycle out in the rain, but also it was very much about place. And so there's a possibility of, of a weather proverb that is capturing something like that. But I think that what, from what you've read, mm -hmm. what we're seeing is that they're doing a lot of other things mm -hmm. and all of those are valid and important. And one that I'm particularly interested in going forward here that we're starting to explore ways in which to do this, places for it are climate proverbs, proverbs that are, that are a, that are ways in which to observe and to even foretell increasing climate change. So the weather proverb, the meta weather proverb in a way. So that that's one thing that we're really thinking a lot about. And I'm hoping that through these workshops that, that can invite more material. I'm also just taking in as much as I can and starting to compose mm -hmm. as well. And well, so speaking about the composition, so the one of the next steps for this project <clears throat> is, so you're all familiar with the uh, kind of the signs that we have going up the hill, mostly related to animals with Paul Maroka's beautiful illustrations. Uh, they're not gonna go away forever, but we are going to, as many as we can get the budget for, uh, to cover with a, hopefully a slate chalkboard, uh, which says future climate proverbs, desert laboratory, and then there will be a prompt of a climate proverb, the first stanza, the first half. Uh, in multiple languages, the intention is to start in English, Spanish, and autumn. And that they will be, the, the prompt is going to be engraved. It's going to be permanent. And then with an underscore, and there will be chalk there waiting for the, anybody who wants to engage to complete that thought, to fill it in. And the the foreman this is all being developed still but is that all of us the stewards uh is a program you all will be helping us maintain this it will be both taking pictures of what's been presented there um tagging it in social media with the future climate proverbs hashtag and then after that thought uh lasts a day or so or perhaps some thoughts that uh don't quite deserve that much mm -hmm. time could be erased and reset and so that the conversation continues and the, the expansion of, uh, of the new ideas get, get presented there. Yeah, I think of this prompting to always be observing and remembering and that memory is essential, but also that we can't rely exclusively on our memories of a place where this becomes nostalgia, mm -hmm. but it needs, Memory is a prompting for active observation and active observation is material for memory. And so ideally what we'll be able to do is I'll, I'll compose some of these in English and we're starting to reach out to people. I just today got a book by oh, yeah. one who we're hoping to reach out to the this remarkable uh, Ophelia Zepeda, who mm -hmm. I've just fallen in love with her poetry. If, if you're listening, Ophelia, <laughs> really, really want to work with you. But it, this, because this is a collaboration with the Poetry Center, we're really looking at this as becoming a collaboration that will bring in exactly. a lot of other voices yeah. in in all of the languages. No, not all of the languages that are spoken on the hill. Because Ooh, that that, it, that's, the, that's where, the, that's where it becomes the Tower of Babel. <laughs> uh, but many of the languages. Yes. Yeah. yeah, very cool. And so another element of this with the Poetry Center is to do a kickoff event down at the boat house with Cream, uh, the uh, uh, design company in town, doing silk screening of shirts or whatever cloth people want to bring in that have the proverb prompts on them, and that uh, you can actually write on the shirts to fill out your own uh, fill-ins, just like the chalk idea with the, with the, um, on the trail. So, so that I mean, that's one of the major goals of pushing that project forward of Jonathan's visit here and. And that's going to be another one of these elements in 2022 that is going to be a direct engagement opportunity and something that we're going to develop with all of you. So, so that's going to be really fun.
it's, I want to be careful with people's time. Um, I have like 10 other questions I want to prompt Jonathan <laughs> with, but instead of, let me give an opportunity for anybody uh, to propose a, a topic or a question that you may have at this point so we can, looking to end on time at seven o'clock. I think folks can just uh, put something in the chat or if you raise your hand or just uh, unmute yourselves and speak. Yeah, Barbara, you're muted still. Great. There. Um, I think, certainly no expert, but it seems to me that a lot of proverbs were really powerful in a society where uh, literacy was uncommon and you had kind of an oral history. Um, and now much of our population's literate, plus we have that whole digital world. Um, I guess my question is how far might the uh, ripples of this project go in terms of reaching people? I think it's an excellent question and Part of what really excites me about engaging these proverbs is the fact that so many of them come out of an oral tradition, but a lot of them cross over. And the Farmer's Almanac is one of the classic places where these proverbs were published for a very long time. And they were really essential for farmers' lives. But I think that we are looking at this in terms of these are tools, these are methods that have worked in many different ways in many different societies. And ours is not a replication of any of those, but where we can learn from these and we can then adapt them. So the use of Instagram, for instance, and having these proverb prompts on the hill where people are able to finish the proverb and where a photograph of that goes up on Instagram. Also, we're looking potentially through the Poetry Center, their relationship with the bus shelters and with the digital boards and the bus shelters. So all the different ways in which these can propagate out. And ideally, there's sort of a serendipitous level at which that propagation takes place that we couldn't design that we aren't going to be able to imagine, but that I envision being somebody reads one of these and it just captures that person's imagination and they repeat it and it gets repeated right. again and it takes on a life of its own because we have, and here I'm going to get a little bit philosophical, maybe, but let's see where this goes. I think that we have lost We've gained so much through literacy, we've lost a lot through literacy as well. And a large part of what we've lost through literacy is a, are other ways in which, which to read, which are not using words, that is to say the way in which we read an environment, the way in which we read each other. And another part of it is the way that we remember the way in which we record and the way in which we access those records. And what I would really like to figure out is how we can have all of that or as much of that as possible present in our world today without trying to be anachronistic, without trying to deny all the technologies that we have right now. How can the technologies that we have right now, those technologies range from Instagram to, to those buses and those bus shelters. And the fact that when you're in a bus shelter with somebody else, that's a possible conversation. That, 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 and that's a technology, that bus shelter, in the sense that it is a shelter for bringing people potentially into a space together. What can we do with these spaces? How can we activate them based on what we know from, or what we, what we think we know, what we assume, what we can imagine from, these other, from other societies? How can we bring that all into our own world to enrich our own experience here as much as possible and also to make to make as much of a connection as possible to all of these phenomena that we need to be attentive to in a way that 
many of us individually are, but societally, we, we clearly are not. Right. So Jonathan, can I talk about technology in that case? Yes, please. So maybe you've already thought of this, but what just went, went into my mind when you're talking about the flowers is a uh, Apple Watch app or a phone app or something that keeps track of where you are and keeps track of these flowering periods. And each year it would be recalibrated so that every year would be, there'd be a different set of, if, if I understand it correctly, so for a period of time, you'd be in this germination period, you'd be in the flower and you'd be in this period and you'd always know where you were, but it would be different each year. Um, so there's an op option for making a digital product out of this organic thing. And I wonder if you're aware of the, all the records of flowering times that have been kept on the hill, most notably by Bill McGinnis, who was one of the early desert researchers. And there's others, and I, I'll show you one when we, when we talk. There's also like maybe uh, averaging some of these years, and there's different species that um, you, could, you could maybe average years, but I kind of like the idea of every year being different as well, and, and making make, so that, uh, that that just can go in a number of places, and I find that really uh, an engaging idea. So yes, all of this is really interesting to me. Uh, can you possibly put the Alaska River Time yeah. URL in? Yeah. So one in Alaska, what we started to do was create a time protocol that was accessible and remains accessible through a website. And this is ideally going to be the basis for those apps where, as you'll see, the code is all, let me just do Alaska. Can you find it? You do about, and then you can just go to click on Alaska River Time at the top left. So just go there. There you go. So just put that in. So as you'll see, this is, it's a platform. It's a protocol, it's a basis for getting people like you, Paul, and that you would be amazing for this, to think about how this is visualized mm. and how this is made available to people. So in this case, this was work that I did at the Anchorage Museum with a graphic designer. We spent a lot of time trying to figure out what, how we might be able to communicate. River time, where river time in this case was an average of five major rivers around Anchorage. And so you have the time kept by each one of the rivers and you could decide that you wanted to be on Matanuska time, for instance, or, or Knick time, or you could be on Alaska River time. And the idea then is with other places such as in Vienna, where I'm now working on this and also in Atlanta, to then have, an, have averages of averages and, and to have nested systems and to have ways in which this relates to our boreal time and as you'll see in the upper right hand corner there's a word code and that is because this is all open source nice. and the idea is let's let's do all of these things that you're envisioning that that other people are envisioning let's make this into a starting point for all the ways in which time can be measured and expressed in our world. So yes, that's definitely part of it. And yes, I'm really looking forward to delving more. I, I've seen that poster that, uh, that, that Ben has shared with me of the flowering times. Mm -hmm. And I'm really interested in the ways in which we can look to the future in relation to that past and those shifts and how we can not only as a matter of data visualization but as a matter of experiential engagement with these with these shifts and with the present reality that we can experience what these other beings are experiencing mm -hmm. at some level yeah well like jonathan i'm not going to go and meet you at day 13 germination pectocaria but yes, you are Personally, planned on that. Are you telling me that you're standing me up 
no, on day 13. No, I'm not, I may or may not, we it may not, we may or may not connect, but like <laughs> I'll personally, I'll always know the Patrick Gary are underground right now. Right now they're germinating. And and only I need to know that. And it will give me all kinds of um golden um awareness and and brilliance. Just me personally knowing that. But I also could use it to meet you. But I think it's just a very personal thing. I want to know the Pector Carrier are underground right now. They may not come up this year or whatever, whatever it is. And all year round and for years to come, I'll know that because of this app that I have on my that's the only good use I could think of for an Apple Watch. I've been trying to think of one. <laughs> well, I mean, I've got a wind up here, so yeah. I'm with you. No, I don't wear a watch, but you know, everyone has their phones on the hill. I don't have one of those either. I've never had a cell phone, so I'm a little bit out of it. But yeah, I, I definitely, I think that we need to find ways in which people can encounter these ideas and encounter the organisms that inspire them in the moment spontaneously and also can take a more committed approach to bringing this into their lives. And that will take different forms. So the PEG calendar is meant also to be something that can exist on paper, that people can visit the hill periodically and recalibrate their paper calendar. It's also something that can be an app. It's also something that can take all these different forms. So for each person, ideally, it's it's whatever whatever you feel is is meaningful to you, however you want to engage this. It's really like the prompts that are prompts for new proverbs these are prompts for for protocols for for ways in which to to calibrate our lives to to reckon time and to reckon with time and to reckon with climate and the world that is changing as the climate changes and i would just maybe you know to keep us on on, on, on time on time that this is a, a evolving uh process you yeah. know and the ideas we're talking about now were not the ideas we had in the same format even three months ago and they're probably not going to be well some of these we're accomplishing but then the next step whatever where we are in three months or your next is going to be different yet and it's something we can all directly participate in both the actualization of them but the creation too so <laughs> it's uh and that's one of the things i just love about the way you work is how um open it is for and so ripe for new approaches and incorporating all these different layers and angles. I think we're all co-PIs in this laboratory that I'm envisioning. Yeah. And that's not to say that you suddenly need to come up with a new grant that has a thousand co-PIs on it. I'm sure that that would be a delight for the university <laughs> system to deal with. But in a metaphorical way, I think that we are all co-PIs yeah. trying to go about this process of research and ideally Everybody we meet becomes a co-PI as well. Yep, I love it. So that's it, Trika. Any last um, parting thoughts or things? Because again, we're not going to probably connect in this venue again until January. Well, I just thought that was pretty darn awesome. Thank you so much. And I had a million questions as well, but I'll get to see you in person. I'm sure I'll be up there tomorrow. Um, and uh, if anybody else has any last comments, throw them out or speak up right now. Um, look for our emails. We'll be sending them out, Mary and I, tomorrow or the next couple of days. Hope as many of you as possible. Well, Jonathan, will you be here? Maybe you could join us on the 6th when we walk up the hill. I wish that I could. Um, <laughs> it, it doesn't seem likely. I will be back in mid the late January, I'll be in back for about a week or a little bit less than a week. And then as often as possible. I mean, I, I, I will wear out my welcome here long before <laughs> I have come anywhere close to satisfying my curiosity about this place. Well, you certainly piqued all of ours uh, curiosities. That is, um, and I'm sure we can't thank you enough. This is recorded. So um, we've captured this uh in the broadest of ways and on a small little uh digital format as well um but we can revisit um and i hope we can many times do exactly that 
Um, we're looking forward to this as it unfolds. And thank you ever so much. Ben, thank you for being able to jump in right now. We're all missing Anna and wishing yes. her well this evening. Absolutely. Um, and into the future, we're getting a I lot of- I talked to her today and she says a big hello to everyone. So she's doing better. Excellent. We're getting a lot of thank yous in the chat right now. I just wanted you to hear that, know that, Jonathan. I can't think of anything else right now. I'm not seeing anything else that's popping up. So I'm looking forward to seeing you all on the Hill. Pay attention to the emails uh, and hope to see you in person in December. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Look forward Bye -bye. to meeting all of you in person. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thanks, Jonathan. It was awesome.